Hey there, it's Dr. Peebler again, back for another episode of cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. So I just wanted to do, uh, you know, take a TO here and, you know, take a breath and uh, just, you know, acknowledge that I understand that we are really in the weeds here, you know, talking about transcription factors and proteins and enzymes and, and a lot of these things. But I do believe it is very important to lay this groundwork because this helps us understand how to attack the problem and to understand how metabolic therapies actually work and through their mechanisms and, and helps us understand how important these therapies are to attacking the true Achilles heel of cancer through its aberrant metabolism. So we have been talking about HIF-1 alpha and the whole HIF family and how important it is to cancer. And really the last video, although we did talk about it in relationship to cancer, I kind of wanted to just give a general overview of what is HIF, what is the mechanism of how it works and why we have it. You know, without HIF, we would be in big trouble. However, cancer cells use HIF to its advantage to avoid a lot of the regulation and protections we have, not only from the intracellular environment, but also from our immune system. So what this picture is essentially showing us here is that HIF-1 alpha is generally, it is activated and destabilized by this PHD enzyme or protein. And we can see that when it's not degraded, like under normal oxygen and normoxic conditions would dictate, it does a lot of important things. One of the most important things that it does to stimulate the tumor microenvironment is through this first pathway here, the stimulation of pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. Now, what that essentially does is, is it shuts down PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme, which prevents pyruvate from getting converted to acetyl-CoA to being used in the Krebs cycle. This essentially shuts down oxidative phosphorylation. This would shunt pyruvate to lactate creating the acidic tumor microenvironment. This is a very important step to look at when considering metabolic therapies. Another thing that it does is it actually shuts down oxidative phosphorylation from occurring by shutting down complex one and two. We're gonna talk about complex one and two as we, as we dive deeper into mitochondrial function in the coming videos, but needless to say, it shuts down oxidative phosphorylation and the goal of that really is actually to protect itself. Remember, HIF-1 is a protective mechanism when you're actually drowning or when you don't have enough oxygen. So what it's actually doing is it's trying to get rid of excess reactive oxygen species, which, what's, which would happen if the electron transport chain was allowed to go on shuttling electrons without a terminal electron acceptor such as oxygen, and you would create excess oxidative stress. So this excess oxidative stress is one of the main signals that stabilizes HIF-1 through the deactivation of PHD, which allows HIF to be stabilized and do its work. Another, another thing that it does is that as, as electron transport and the TCA cycle start to shut down, it's basically no longer rotating and spinning like it normally would. So you get buildup of intermediates such as fumarate, succinate, among others, malate, et cetera. And those then further inhibit this protein, PHD, which continues to stabilize HIF-1. Another important thing that is occurring at the same time is HIF-1 is actually causing excess pathologic, in cancer's case, destruction of mitochondria. So as we'll talk about mechanistically in the future, very likely dysfunctional mitochondria leading to Excess reactive oxygen species stimulates HIF, and then excess HIF will excessively get rid of mitochondria, dictating that there is not enough mitochondrial function left for metabolism, feeding us into this vicious cycle of requiring the Warburg effect and heavy exclusive survival need by cancer cells to use glucose and glutamine. This is a really interesting slide because it shows how all of these factors are interrelated. We're going to talk in detail later about how inflammation is a major driver of cancer and many chronic diseases. But it's also interesting because HIF-1, when activated, also increases inflammation and, again, is another wheel 
of this vicious cycle that occurs when HIF-1 is activated. So hypoxia is one of the most common conditions encountered in tumor microenvironment. We've talked about that pretty much at length. And we know that that hypoxia is driving tumor genesis. Most responses to hypoxia are elicited by the family of transcription factors called hypoxia-inducible factors. We know that, which induce expression of a diverse set of genes that assist cells to adapt to hypoxic environments. Among these HIF proteins, the role of HIF-1 is established in cancer progression. So as cancer progresses, more HIF-1 is released as further genomic deregulation and mitochondrial dysfunction is further minimized and lost, and the cell loses complete control of the cell cycle and cell growth. This is just another example of how HIF is related to all of the progression of, of cancer, whether it be the metabolism and the Warburg effect, whether it be angiogenesis and creating new red blood cells, whether it be EMT, which stands for epithelial mesenchymal transition, CSC, cancer stem cells, migration and invasion into other tissues, surrounding tissues, the progression of tumor acidosis, which we've been, we talked about at length during the tumor microenvironment and Warburg effect videos, and kind of what we've been talking about today, the actual increase in inflammatory mediators. Interestingly enough, inflammatory mediators will lead to activation of HIF, acidosis will lead to activation of HIF, and aberrant metabolism through lactate will lead to the activation of HIF. This all leads to, of course, tumor progression, further disease, burden, and unfortunately, our demise. This is just a representation of how HIF is at the center of cancer metabolism and the driving of the Warburg effect, acidosis. It also leads to chemotherapy resistance. The acidosis, of course, leads to immune resistance. It's really, if you, if you look at it, it's, it's a very elegant model. And when you think about it in this way, you really start to think about where the Achilles heel is and where as a patient and as a clinician, we need to focus upon. This is a paper showing how either hypoxia or pseudo hypoxia can lead to the activation of HIF. And I just want to take a second to actually talk about pseudo hypoxia. So hypoxia, we've talked about as being a low oxygen environment and really hypoxia, given the name hypoxia inducible factor is the reason for the protein to exist because if we have low oxygen environment, we need to have ways to survive at least temporarily until we can exit that environment or else we're going to die. However, pseudo hypoxia is interesting because pseudo hypoxia essentially means that there are factors that are activating hypoxia inducible factors and hypoxia induced genes that have really nothing to do with oxygen. There are many things, and we're going to talk about pseudo hypoxia throughout this video series, but some of those things would be like we talked about excess lactate. Lactate will actually drive HIF-1 stabilization or some of the buildup of the TCA cycle intermediates such as succinate and fumarate. Those, when those build up, those can stabilize HIF and further allow for the downstream effects such as the Warburg metabolism to continue. I wanted to mention that if you can find the right practitioner, we can detect these things, okay? This is not something that a normal doctor in a primary care office or a normal oncologist is going to be able to look at, not because they're not smart enough, but because they don't know that these tools exist. So within the realm of integrative and functional medicine, for many years, they have had tests called organic acid tests. In conventional medicine, we use these to a very, very low degree. We may use methylmalonic acid as an indirect measure of B12 deficiency. We may use homovanilinic acid, vandamanilate, in looking for a rare tumor called a pheochromocytoma. We may look at 5-indole acetate. But in general, medicine, conventional medicine does not use these markers. And these tests are unfortunately not paid for by insurance. They are ran by specialized labs. And then you have to have a doctor with the wherewithal and the training to actually be able to look at these tests. But the bottom line is we can measure these things. You know, we, we've talked about how lactate, now lactate is something that we check in the hospital quite often, usually in the terms of sepsis. But in general, we, we have the ability to check a blood lactate level. We also have the ability to check urine lactate level. We can check all of the intermediate steps of the TCA cycle to see if they're building up. And if they're building up, then ultimately that can lead to HIF stabilization and the creation of the Warburg effect. So I just want to let you know, as the patient, 
if you can find the right doctor who can run these kind of tests, you can start to look at risk factors and you can start to see whether or not you're making a difference in your treatment using metabolic approaches. I hope this helps. And I look forward to continuing the discussion about cancer and its metabolic origins and what we can ultimately do for it. Until next time.